Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guests today are Garrett Auer, advocate for establishing municipal broadband, and Russell Sr., president of Personal Telco Project. So welcome to the program. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So we're we're here because, in part, uh, because the FCC, the Federal Communication Committee Commission, uh, made a decision re recently. So talk about the decision. So in short, um, what the repeal of net neutrality means is that a small handful of corporations will have the ability to control what we see and do on the internet by blocking and slowing down content. That is an extremely um, unpopular move. As uh, you might have seen online, there's a lot of ne negative discussion about it. Um, it's the popularity of um, net neutrality was very high because so many people benefit in our society from a free and open internet. Uh, really the only people who don't are the companies that want to sell you um, access to websites and services like they sell you access to channels and cable packages and that's not something anyone wants. It's a very threat to, it's a very real threat to democracy and freedom of information. So. We're promoting municipal broadband in the city of Portland as a way to circumvent this and protect the internet and keep it open and free as it should be. The reason this is actually essential is not only have they repealed net neutrality, they have also created rules against localities creating their own legislation to properly police internet providers. So. That's really why there's such an urgent need for the city of Portland to start building out its own internet infrastructure. But this is something which we've been talking about for many years now, and the reason is it's a good investment. It's something that we should have done years ago. And now that our online freedom and, is it, and privacy as well um, are at risk, it's something that's come back up again, and I think it's something that we're gonna be moving forward with. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, and Portland, uh, had an experiment with public broadband at, at one time, probably, what, 15 years ago? Uh, I think you're referring to the, the Metrify. Yes. Yes. That, is, mm -hmm. that was uh, uh, a project that was instigated by the, the city, but that was actually uh, implemented by uh, a private company that uh, didn't really know what they were doing. And um, so, you know, it collapsed within about a year. Uh, but that wasn't something that the city was investing funds in. Oh, really? Oh, okay, I, I didn't realize that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so it, it was a private company, yes. and it was like, what, permitted by the city? So the city was uh, was interested in creating more pipes into the house because of the comp competitive environment in Portland, which is bad, as it is in most places. Um, and so they were motivated to, to, uh, to provide a, uh, an extra, another way for people at home to get internet access. And they, um, they actually had seen what the Personal Telco Project had done. There was a, a general movement around the country that about municipalities um, uh, creating these public, what they called Muni Wi-Fi at the time, municipal Wi-Fi networks, to provide this extra pipe into the home. And um, they put out an RFP and uh, requested people uh, to, to create a proposal around um, building such a, a mini Wi-Fi system. And um, a particular vendor came along. There were multiple bids. There were six bids. There were three finalists. One of the finalists was a company that said, we'll do this for free. You don't have to, to pay anything. Um, you have to provide us some mounting assets, that is uh, street light arms and signal arms and so forth, to put our equipment on. but." Uh, otherwise, we'll operate this Wi-Fi network uh, and try to provide uh, <laughs> this alternative uh, internet connection into the home. What um, what happened was it doesn't work very well, and the company that implemented it kind of was doing it on the cheap in a way and kind of doing it on the dumb in another way because they, 
they, uh, they had a business model that wasn't going to work very well. And it turned out the network didn't work very well. I actually participated in a project to try to kind of monitor how it was working. And um, you know we were well aware that it wasn't working very well. And uh, the business model didn't, for that did not work. They were attempting to earn money by selling uh, banner advertisements. Um, and you know, during an era when uh, when that was going to stop working because of encryption, uh, you know, HTTPS encryption, you could they would the, the <laughs> you weren't going to be able to inject ads anymore the way they were mm -hmm. doing it. Um, and eventually, they're actually after only about six months of of operation, their investors kind of decided that this was not a good investment, and they stopped. And uh, and then about a year later. They just uh, they tried to sell themselves. They tried to get more money from the city, and the city refused intelligently. Uh, and uh, that whole business collapsed, and they abandoned all their equipment. And in fact, a lot of it ended up in my my garage because <laughs> we asked you know, the organization I'm with is the Personal Telco Project, and we do Wi-Fi around the the city. And we asked for that equipment, which was now the property of the city, having been abandoned. Uh, and uh, we were interested in possibly trying to use it uh, to generate a public benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, t talk about your company. Did your company start so prior we're, to this? We're a corporation, but we're a nonprofit corporation. Okay. So we're um, yeah. We started in in the year two thousand. Uh, and I'm sorry, this Metro. The company was called Metrofy that okay. collapsed. And when when did that come? That was two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. So they so collapsed. Eventually, ultimately, collapsed in two thousand eight. Okay. So they were in operation for about eighteen months. Okay. And your company started about seven years before that. That's correct. Okay. And I was not involved at the beginning, but I got involved in two thousand seven, and uh, we're a group of volunteers that uh, help people build um, public access Wi-Fi networks as a voluntary uh, activity to try to make their communities better and also to just let people get access to the internet, which we think is an important value. So that's what we've done, uh, but we're, we're primarily interested in building networks that are um, uh, of value to the, the user and that the user is operated in the, the, the users, the networks are operated in the user's interests. And so we've been interested in uh, uh, publicly owned uh, internet infrastructure from the beginning, uh, and um, uh, we got particularly interested when we discovered that the city was was looking at building a fiber network in Portland in 2007, uh, which they studied. They had two different feasibility studies, the second of which basically laid out a business case for for doing that, and uh, the city council ultimately decided uh, that they thought. They thought it was too risky. The, the the commissioner in charge of the bureau that developed the plan said, "This is too risky. I don't recommend going forward at this time." And then basically just put it on a shelf and mm -hmm. and uh, and you know never to be uh, addressed again. And I felt at that time, and I felt since then that this is an essential thing for us to be doing, and that you know if it really was r just risky. Uh, that they should be looking at mitigating that risk rather than just, you know, abandoning, uh, abandoning the use the network end users to you know their fate and the jaws of the, mm -hmm. you know, the the telecommunication companies, yeah. which so, is so what they've done. Can, can we name names? Who was the commissioner that that shelved this? That, the commissioner at that time was Dan Saltzman. It was Dan Saltzman? Yeah. Okay. There, I I was at the meeting, the work session where that occurred, and. Uh, I, I was impressed. The, the commissioner that actually seemed to get it the best was Randy Leonard, who said, you know, if we don't do anything, we're not going to be putting any pressure on the, the, the incumbent telecommunications companies, the phone company and the cable company. And everybody kind of nodded their head and then, you know, nothing happened. And, walked away. and there have been a whole series of, of things since then. Uh, Google came along in, in 2010 and uh, what had Offered this idea that one of they they build a fiber network in one city in the in the country and the uh, the city of Portland put in a bid of you know like a thousand different places in in the United States and uh, they of course they didn't get that and um, a few years later there was a, a thing called the broadband strategic plan where city staff 
we're trying to come up with, um, you know, to uh, get the city to, to think about uh, the broad, broadband landscape in Portland. Um, and they ultimately came up with a plan, but it, it, it was just, um, you know, it was a kind of a, um, kind of a think piece not really very much action involved, no resources really behind it at all. And so we're still remain in the situation where we're at the mercy of the, you know, for-profit large telecommunication carriers. There was a, then we went through another period of a couple years where Google said, oh, we're, we're gonna come back. You know, we're, we're very interested in Portland. They've got a franchise agreement with the city. They actually amended the franchise agreement with the city uh, and then um, just, a year or two ago, finally said, oh, well, you know, we're actually putting the full fiber thing on the back burner, and so we're not gonna do that, um, which to me was another opportunity to get people thinking about, you know, how are we going to um, do self-help here, and how can the community build a network that actually serves everybody's interest that they own rather than rent forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, the, the, the business case for that is excellent uh, because when you build it and it's publicly owned, you're ba paying for it once. Whereas if you continually rent it from the, the telephone company or the, the cable company, you're just, you're paying for the same infrastructure over and over and over and over again, you know, for as long as you're gonna be alive. And, um, you know, my back of the envelope calculation shows that it's, it's like a 20 to one uh, um, advantage and over the long term, maybe only 10 to one, mm -hmm. but you know, substantial advantage to buying this, uh, the infrastructure rather than uh, renting it. The additional, just to follow up on that, it's not just a cost thing, is one of the advantages that the for-profit companies have is that they, they're they vertically integrated, that is, they provide the whole stack of services, and because they're a sole source for those things, they have immense uh, pricing control on all of them, which gives them the ability to um, build in large mar profit margins on, on all of those things. Uh, so if, the, if you have publicly owned infrastructure, you can uh, break that vertical integration and get service providers actually, actually competing between themselves and squash a lot of that profit margin out, and, um, and you know, which is obviously a, an advantage to the end user that's paying for it. So, is, isn't that what happens though? Is that if you had a, a you know a viable municipal option um, that was competing with these companies, then wouldn't they just lower their prices until they snuff the the public uh, entity out? They potentially could do that, and that's a, that is a risk. And in fact, that was one of the risks that that Salzman cited, or that he felt like. There's, in fact, there's an example of that. There's a, um, uh, a municipal network in Tacoma, Washington, that has, a, um, I believe it's a fiber network, and uh, Comcast rates there are very reasonable. You can argue that that's a, that's a giant public advantage too. Even, you know, they built a public network that's paying for itself, and the incumbent had to lower their prices to compete with that. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, they didn't manage to snuff it out, you got more choices on the on the public network. It's still there. It was built, and it's still there. And um, uh, even the the Comcast subscribers are are reaping an advantage of that. So that it's a risk to the financial viability of a municipal network. Mm -hmm. However, uh, and, um, everybody's still reaping an advantage. And on top of that, um, um, Comcast and CenturyLink are so widely unpopular yes. that. Uh, <laughs> that, um, you know, I mean, people, there is an expectation that, oh, you know, uh, that's the way you get internet, you just pay people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and you, every check, every month you write a big check to somebody and you get this great thing called the internet, but it's not the only way and there's vastly better ways and I think the public can be educated on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, yeah. And, and so, uh, prior to the ban, or the uh, push to do a municipal, there was your company, so, Talk for just a few minutes about how your co company acts and provides uh, broadband. So we're uh, we're again we're not we're, we don't think of ourselves as a company. We're a corporation, but we're a nonprofit corporation. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're really just a few volunteers. So we, we would call you an entity. 
I guess so, yeah. <laughs> we're a nonprofit. We're a volunteer based nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's a fair characterization. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we basically um, sit around and wait for somebody to call us and say, hey, we, we saw one of your networks. We used one of your networks. We think what we're doing is great. There's some Wi Fi network somewhere in the city. And we want to do that too because we think that's a great thing to do. We think it's a benefit to everybody around us. We want to enrich our environment. Uh, and uh, so they come to us and, and, um, and we, we show them what it'll take to build a, a, a public access Wi-Fi network and they say, okay, that sounds like a good idea and then we go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. Something like um, uh, in 2016, these are the last numbers we've actually looked at, uh, 220,000 people connected to our networks, although a lot of them were single people uh, you know, one time only, uh, but you know, uh, five or ten thousand people connect to our networks habitually. You know, either every day or every week or something. Mm -hmm. So we do have a substantial impact on the community, and those are people who are getting free internet where they might not otherwise. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. So talk talk about <clears throat> well a couple of things. Uh, I'm wondering about. How, how do we afford, how do we finance a municipal system? And then how would your system, the, the municipal, our system, <laughs> how would it interact with, with, with his uh, personal telco company? So that's a really good question. First thing that a lot of people will say, one of the most common objections is, oh, I don't want my tax money going to this. Yes. Well, good news, it doesn't need to, because the build out of municipal broadband in Portland would not be funded through taxation, it would be funded through bonds. So it would be funded through a bond sale and then afterwards it would be just like any other utility provided at cost to users. The revenue that it generates would be used to pay off um, the cost of construction and then finance the operation of the network. And in the end, because of the dramatically lower cost of this network, it'll save Portlanders and businesses money. So it's not something that's going to cost you money, it's something that's going to save you money. Mm -hmm. um, what was the second part of that question? Oh. Uh, how, how would that work with his company? Something that I think so I think, okay. um, uh, I think uh, one of the ways, that one of the, the impediments to people uh, sharing their internet now is that they, they have a feeling of scarcity and mm -hmm. that that bandwidth is scarce and I need to protect my little chunk of bandwidth from you know these hordes of people around me that want to take it away. And I think if you build a fiber network in particular, fiber has such immense capacity that the, this, the idea of scarcity just kind of goes away and it makes sharing much more uh, practical and, and uh, less scary for people. Yeah. This is, so we, we have a fiber network that's under the streets now. So are, are, are you suggesting that we should? Well, we don't. We don't generally. We don't. Okay. We, no. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, CenturyLink has built some fiber. There has been some fiber that we predated that that went to various companies in particular, but um, uh, up until recently there wasn't uh, generally fiber everywhere. And in particular, it's not underground in most of the cities. And it's so on telephone poles. In, in most cases, actually, now yes. it, it's coming off the off the poles. Yes. Right. Okay. It's beaming. So right. what we what we have for communications infrastructure in Portland uh, historically was we had a cable system, which is a coaxial cable that runs down the street, that's been uh, at one time when it was just television was just like one giant coax that went across the whole city, you know, they got split and, and uh, um, amplified and sent down all the little lanes. And uh, Comcast has built fiber to little chunks of, of, um, of that coax so as to be able to provide more bandwidth as, as the internet service on that coaxial uh, cable has increased. And then uh, we had the telephone system, which was just the old twisted pair wiring that made your phone ring, you know, for decades and decades since, you know, the telephone came to Portland in, you know, 100 years ago. And, uh, uh, and for a long time you could get DSL. You still can get DSL over that if you live within certain distances of the, the telephone company's equipment. Uh, but the, the bandwidth available on that DSL is very limited, uh, especially in the upstream the upstream bandwidth is a problem for, for uh, coaxial cable as well, 
for the cable system. Um, and then CenturyLink, just within the past few years, has started to build a fiber network in Portland, which is great, uh, but, you know, they're not a fantastic company, and, uh, and uh, you know, they've got problems with their billing practices and so forth. Uh, and so they're, they're not a, a widely loved uh, company either. That infrastructure does exist in some places, and it's uh, for that it's great. And the beautiful thing again about f fiber is the cap capacity is so huge. Um, you know, one strand there was a, there was a wireless service called Clear in Portland mm -hmm. um, uh, that just ended a few years ago. I think they finally pulled the plug on. That wasn't super high speed, but it was available in lots of places. And again, it was an alternative way to the uh, way people could get internet service outside of the telephone company and the cable company. And I noted in, in a presentation I gave once that the entire build out of that clear network in Portland could be carried on single strand of fiber easily. Hmm. So if you can get fiber built that people can are actually empowered to use, and the only way they're empowered to use it is if they own it through a, a public utility, then, um, you know, their their bandwidth problem sort of goes away. They just they're not uh, there's just so immense capacity in that fiber. Okay. This is so so a public broadband can be cheaper and faster. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What 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 about people who are currently left out? So that is a fantastic question, and that's one of the things that I think is perhaps the most powerful about building out a municipal broadband network is that the potential for um, increasing access to the internet, high quality internet of that, is immense here. Uh, we will be able to give people who are you know, low income, like right now Comcast does offer a reduced rate for people who are low income, but it's... Reduced it's, rate, reduced servers. Yes. It's, yeah, <laughs> they still make a profit off of that. Uh -huh. um, uh, and, and that's how much it costs them to provide the service that they're providing. Um, and it's, it's hard to get, it's inaccessible. We want to provide something that ensure, we want to create a system that ensures every member of our community will have access to the internet because it is a basic utility. It's an essential utility. They need to perform in the basic functions of our society. You can't apply for a job without access to the internet. You can't educate yourself and learn basic information that you'll need to you know, vote in an upcoming election mm -hmm. without access to the internet. That's how we do everything these days. So it's absolutely important that we are coming at it from a perspective of it being essential and something that everyone needs access to. And um, another point that I wanted to bring up as well was uh, it's not only the repeal of net neutrality that is kind of putting uh, Americans at risk here. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the government repealed essential regulations which previously uh, made it so internet service providers were unable to sell your personal information without getting your permission first. So now they can. Uh, and that is a tremendous privacy concern. They can do anything you want with information about what you do online, and that's something which um, not, many, not very many people are comfortable with. So oh, yeah. mm -hmm. municipal broadband would solve that problem as well. Okay. Any, any, other, any other questions or any other things that would solve that I'm not thinking of? Well, so one of the, one of the yeah. things you touched on uh, there was I, I have a kid in, that's in Portland Public Schools, and I go to back to school night and the teachers trot out, you know, their syllabus and so forth and the resources and how to contact them and so forth. It's all online. Mm -hmm. There are, and I know there are kids in those, some of those classrooms, in all of those classrooms, some kids don't have internet at home. Oh. And that mm -hmm. puts them at a tremendous disadvantage in succeeding in school mm -hmm. because it's just more or less assumed these days. Uh, yes, uh -huh. uh, yeah, 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 I, I know I, I would feel I mean, particularly since I grew up without the internet and didn't ha have any idea what it was, and kind of grew up with it, um, 
I would feel totally lost without you now. It would be like a, a major part of my life would be gone. I, yeah, well, a major part of your brain, actually. <laughs> because part of you, my can, brain. you can view uh, the internet and the knowledge that it provides as a sort of external hard drive for the human mind these days. It's, mm -hmm. We don't remember a lot of information um, that we learn. We kind of you know, view it as this, uh, we view the internet as this kind of archive that we can pull information from at any time. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it's kind of fundamentally changing the way that we are using information as a species, and that's something that everyone should be a part of. Uh, yes, right, yeah. So 30 seconds for a final concluding statement. So Municipal Broadband PDX is going to be hosting events every single month in front of City Hall. The next one's on February 13th. If you'd like to get involved, that's February 13th, front of City Hall at 2 o'clock. Um, it's going to be a fun time. Um, we're also going to be hosting a um, series of events just like this one uh, every single month. Uh, join Municipal Broadband PDX on Facebook, the group, um, if you'd like to uh, stay up to date on what's going on. Great. Good. Thank you both very much You're for welcome. being here. I appreciate it. All Thank right. you. Right. Good. Thank you. All right. Our guests today, Garrett Auer and Russell Sr., have both been advocates working toward the establishment of public broadband service here in Portland, Oregon. Please visit their website, www.municipalbroadbandpdx.org. Moving on to health care as a human, universal, affordable right here in Oregon. Representative Mitch Greenlick uh, has proposed the HOPE Act here in the uh, Oregon Legislature for the, during the short session beginning on February 5th. The bill number HJR 203 would establish a state constitutional amendment to, quote, ensure that every resident of Oregon has access to effective, medically appropriate, and affordable health care as a fundamental right, unquote. This would establish a constitutional right and therefore an obligation uh, for the legislature to do something uh, about health care in Oregon. HJR 203 would need to be enacted by the legislature as a referral to the voters in the November 2018 uh, voters pamphlet for its eventual enactment. What can you do to advance this? The most important action to take right now is to contact your Oregon State Senator and Representative. Let them know that you, they should sign on to uh, this bill as a co-sponsor. Let's take this next step toward universal, affordable health care for all Oregonians. Remember that you can watch Populous Dialogues anytime on YouTube. Uh, to receive notification when a new program is added, just click on the subscribe button while watching a program. Thank you for watching our program today. I hope we'll see you again next time. Bye. <laughs>